Hey, Russ, can you do me a favor and turn on these lights right here so I can see these people's faces? I want to make sure that yeah. I was talking about the people that were like, Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, we are in the middle of a series, um, which is going to go for about the next uh, coming today, three Sundays. And uh, that series is called Investing in Futures. And um, when uh, I was talking with some other pastors about this a couple months ago, several of us were talking about the issue of giving and tithing and resources and stewardship. And several of the pastors, we all agreed that it's a very hard subject to teach about. But I will tell you this. I've received more uh, interaction in terms of emails and phone calls back and forth from you people on this subject than anything we've done combined. Uh, and I think it's because we're all facing um, uncertain days in terms of finances and resources and people are genuinely worried about it. And, and I think there is some uh, great benefit for the church uh, to speak forthrightly about the issue and um, as, as other issues as well. So um, if you are a guest with us here today and you just happen to stop by, this is your first time. Please do not think that Pastor Tom is up here asking and begging for your money. That's not what we're doing. We have a goal this year. Our goal is for all of us to become healthy people. Two places, in our finances and in our relationships. And uh, that's why we're in the middle of, of this particular series. And this will probably be something that we come back to uh, throughout the year. So if you're a guest with us, uh, this isn't Pastor Tom going after your checkbook. This is uh, God trying to uh, demonstrate to you and teach you a little bit about stewardship and responsibility with our finances, like he's trying to teach me as well. So if you have your Bible and you want to follow along, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 4. And I will almost uh, virtually guarantee that you've never heard a stewardship uh, uh, message based on this section of Scripture. And I will tell you, I had something else completely different in mind. And uh, while I was working on it on Monday, I just kept struggling with it. And it just didn't seem to, uh, to, to work out. And I really felt directed to this particular section of Scripture or as some pastors would say, this passage, that really sounds so impressive, uh, but this little piece of the Bible. And so uh, we're going to read together from Matthew chapter 4, a very interesting story. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Now pay attention to that process, because it's the Spirit of God leading Jesus to be tempted. After he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. No kidding. The tempter came to him and said... If you are the Son of God, then tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, But it is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So the devil took him to the holy city, which would be where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And he had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He said, If you are the Son of God, then throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands. And that you will not even strike your foot against the stone. For those of you who have wondered, that's, a, that's scripture and that's from Psalms. So Satan is referring to the Bible. Jesus answered him, yeah, but it's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. In verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. And he showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give to you, he said to Jesus, if you would just bow down and worship me. But Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written... To worship the Lord your God and to serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. So the question today is what can we learn from the story about stewardship? Here's part of it. The battle against Satan is always fought the same way. The battle is always the same way. The issues are always the same issues. Not only that, but the choices are always the same choices. And the results are always the same results. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to Satan. It's the same argument, it's the same battle, it's the same choices, and it's ultimately the same results from the choices that we make. They say that if you continue to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result, that is the definition of what? Insanity. Okay? And so when we fight and we struggle against temptation, we keep doing the same thing, we're always going to get the same thing. So what can his time in the desert teach us about stewardship? This is an interesting thought. And here's Jesus all by himself, out of the middle of nowhere, and then all of a sudden he has a companion. But what can we learn from Jesus in the time he spent in the desert? Let's pray. God, uh, talk really loud. Shout at us if you need to. Shake us up. Get in our face. And, and really rattle our cage today and help us to understand uh, what we can learn from this example and how we can apply it to life in 2009. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you imagine this is a face-to-face -face meeting with your arch enemy? 
Jesus has been out there now for 40 days, 40 nights, the Bible says, minding his own business, and out of nowhere, up walks the one kid, the bully on the block that you really don't like. Now, what I wish we could understand is the other conversation that took place other than these three or four sentences. Okay, but up walks your absolute enemy. The one who, it's not that he even likes you. He has one mission, and his mission is to ultimately is to destroy you. And in the process, you have to be prepared for the meeting. You know, I think about, uh, you know, our Secretary of State and the government people, and they're walking over, they've got the war going on over there now. How do you sit down across from the table with people that you know don't like you? You've got to really, really be prepared for that meeting. You've got to know who's where and what's what and names of people and what we should do and what we shouldn't do and what you're willing to give and what you're not. I couldn't handle that kind of pressure. I have enough trouble ordering through the drive-thru. Okay? That's why I'm glad they came up with the number system. I'll just have a number four. Thank you and go on about my way. I can't imagine the pressure of dealing with what we deal with, but in this case, the spiritual dimension of Jesus having this debate uh, with Satan. The interesting thing about it is Christ prepared for the meeting in a very unique way. What did he do? What did he do? He prayed? That's not what it says. It says he fasted and prayed. It's not just enough to just pray. Jesus was out fasting. Now, I don't know if you, how many of you have ever fasted other than for a medical reason. Okay? Fasting is, uh, it's interesting, fasting is when we willfully give up something that we normally use or something that we would do. Fasting doesn't necessarily mean you go without food. Fasting, for some of us, ought to mean to go without television. Sorry. Or People Magazine. Or whatever your thing is. Fasting is a willful choice to put aside something that distracts you or consumes you. Or that you think you have to have to live. Okay? Fasting sometimes is food. Some people fast with food. Some people fast with no liquid. Some people drink liquids but no food. It's just whatever is between you and God. It's fast. Some of you would say, well, that sounds like Lent. Okay? But fasting is a willful choice that has a spiritual purpose behind it. I want God to do something and to show him I'm serious. I'm willing to give up something that I think that I need so that he can provide for me in spite of what I think. Now, I don't know if you've ever really been hungry. And I'm not talking about where your stomach kind of growls. I'm not aware your stomach's like inside out and it starts to eat itself. That kind of hungry. Okay? If you've never experienced that, you ought to try it one time. All you got to do is go about three days. And after three days, you'll really be hungry. Now, I have a friend. His name is Miles McPherson. I was a former pro football player. And he went on a 40-day fast. And when he was done, he looked like he had suffered from a horrible disease. He lost so much weight. But it changed his life. And the reason is because fasting has a spiritual discipline. And it's a, the desire for fasting is to learn to deny yourself. Okay? I need Doritos. No, you really don't. Okay? I need to watch ESPN. No, you really don't. I need to go golfing. I'll throw myself in there twice. No, you really don't. Okay? Fasting is when we choose to give something up. And here's why. The more often we say no to ourselves the easier it is to say yes to God. The more times I say no to me, nine times in a row, I'm more likely to be able to say yes to God. Okay? So the more times I deny me, the easier it is to follow God. Because the truth is, God and me are, are at, at war. I have a will. He has a plan. My will and his plan don't always mix. Okay? So fasting is the ability to say no to me so that ultimately I can say yes to God. Fasting helps us hear God. It helps us obey God. It helps us to do what he's asking us to do and to understand it. And if you're in a situation, Jesus at one point said, there are some things that can't be resolved except through prayer and fasting. Those are Jesus' words. And if you're in a situation, you're considering a job or a relationship or a choice or whatever, I dare you to fast and pray. God, what do you want? Because the weird part is, God will tell you. God will tell you. Because that's what fasting does. It makes you much more attuned because you become more dependent upon. He was out there, and the Bible says 40 days, 40 nights. Okay? Now, in Bible terms, that means a long, long time. 